This is CBC Here and Now. We've had cars stolen outside of people's homes. We've had numerous quads, power tools, stuff like that stolen. So it seems to be pretty frequently. Frustrated with crime in their community, support for a father and son now facing kidnapping and assault charges. Why they believe the men are victims, not criminals. Good evening and welcome to Here and Now. I'm Debbie Cooper. And I'm Anthony Germain. Whitless Bay is backing a father and son facing serious charges in an apparent act of retaliation. More than 100 residents rallied to show their support last night and a handful of them were in court today for the men's bail hearing. Here and Now's Katie Breen was also there. Katie, what were people saying today? Well, they say they're behind Stephen and Mitchell Maloney because they understand their frustration. They say crime is rising in Whitless Bay and people don't feel protected. The Maloneys are accused of breaking into a man's home in paradise on Friday, assaulting and kidnapping him. The victim was able to flag down police in Mount Pearl, according to an RNC press release. That's when he was taken to hospital and police arrested the father and son. Uh, we have a lot of sympathy for those guys. They work very hard every day to go to sea to try to make a living. And now their equipment was stolen and taken from them. The day before the alleged kidnapping, the son, Mitchell, posted on Facebook that his boat was broken into and survival suits, among other things, were stolen. Cal, who organized the rally in support of the Maloney's last night, says it was the latest in a string of break-ins. People are losing their quads, they're losing uh, power tools. I mean, basically, if you leave home, you nearly have to park a vehicle across your garage door. And every night, people are, you know, cars are being burnt. It was, uh, it's not a good situation. He doesn't condone violence, but Cal says he understands what the Maloney's are accused of doing. He says it's frustrating, and police need to do more to communicate what they're doing to fight crime in the area. I think they need more help. I think they need more presence in the area to this thing is uh, resolved. The Maloney's were granted bail today. One of the conditions, that they'll stay away from the person they're accused of attacking. They're both scheduled to appear in court next month. They haven't pleaded either way. If we came out yesterday and stood beside them, I certainly had to stand by them today. I just received a response from the RCMP. It says that criminal rates in Whitless Bay have remained relatively consistent over the last number of years. Police are encouraging people to report crime and say that adjustments to patrols can be made once patterns are noticed. Reporting live for Here Now, I'm Katie Breen in St. John's. Now, Anthony, you spoke with organizer Mike Cal mm -hmm. about a surge of crime in his community. Yeah, that's right. I was at court with uh, Katie today, and that conversation's coming up in about uh, half an hour. Well, all three men charged with the 2016 murder of Stephen Miller have pleaded guilty to the lesser charge of manslaughter. Paul Connolly, the last of the trio, entered a guilty plea in Supreme Court today. This after pleading not guilty to the charge of first-degree murder. In exchange, several other charges against Connolly were dropped. Police say three masked men took Stephen Miller from his home in Seal Cove in July of 2016. Four hours later, his body was discovered at the end of a driveway in Kelligrews. Connolly, Chesley Lucas and Calvin Kenny have all pleaded guilty to the crime. Of mice and movies, one cinema goer was not too impressed with what she saw on the floor of the Avalon Mall's movie theater. I'm Jeremy Eaton and I'll have that story coming up. There's more conflict tonight between Nalcor and the company that's building the Muskrat Falls Generation Facility and doing other key work in Labrador. Our Rob Antle has been following this story for us and has the latest. Supreme Court in St. John's is a long way from Labrador, where work continues to finish the Muskrat Falls Hydro Project. But it's the latest battleground in a fight between Nalcor Energy and its main contractor there, Astaldi. Astaldi has been having financial issues both here and abroad. The parent company in Italy is in creditor protection. The Canadian division is facing tens of millions in claims over unpaid bills in Labrador, while work continues to wrap up its construction contract on Muskrat Falls. Astaldi wants more money. Nalcor says it's making payments in accordance with its contracts. Lawyers for Astaldi and Nalcor were at Supreme Court today. 
where documents revealed some new information. Nalcor's Muskrat Falls Corporation issued a notice of default to Astaldi on September 28th, a day after Astaldi gave notice it wanted to go to arbitration. That's a request Nalcor rejected. The two sides are at odds over what should happen next and where. The question today was a procedural motion over whether a court in Ontario should hear this or a court in Newfoundland and Labrador. Both sides agreed on this province. The matter is due back in court next week. Nalcor isn't commenting, only saying it's status quo at the Muskrat Falls site, at least for now. Rob Antle, CBC News, St. John's. Well, staying with the mega project, Memorial University economists took the stand at the Muskrat Falls inquiry today, each with a very different take on the project. First, it was Wade Locke, who believed Muskrat Falls was the best option for the province. Locke argued that natural gas was a good option for generating power, rather was not a good option for generating power, and he excluded it from consideration when he did a presentation on those options back in 2012. Locke has done work for the provincial government and was seen as a Muskrat Falls supporter. But he says after his 2012 presentation, he was vilified and insulted by the public, and if he had the time back, he never would have made the presentation. I'm okay with how I analyze and present it. What I'm not okay with is the personal attacks that have come along and how that sends a message to young academics at the university so that unless you're going to be on the um, popular side uh, that's popular with a whole pile of people, you're going to be attacked. So what you should do if you're an academic at a university is address issues that will get you promoted and get you tenured. And those are not the kinds of issues that I've been spending my time on. And so what I've learned is that if I had my time back, I would not have gotten involved in this year because of the nastiness that's involved in this particular project. And that really is unfortunate. And that's true for all parties, not just true for a particular group. And so if any I learn is listen to my wife. She said, don't do it. I shouldn't have did it. Jim Fian is the other Memorial University economist with a much different take than Locke. Fian had proposed several alternatives to Muskrat Falls, such as burning cleaner fuel at Holyrood, adding wind power, and allowing smaller projects in the hydroelectric field. And he recommended encouraging electricity users to use less, which includes charging customers higher rates for electricity during peak times. Fian says those options combined would have been less risky than building Muskrat Falls. And so when you put everything or a huge amount of your resources money into a single big irreversible project uh, that means you haven't diversified you put a lot of weight on one thing whereas with uh, an improved isolated island option or even the options that they that was in existence that was proposed you still had the advantage of adding to capacity over time if indeed consumption went up you could add a small hydro site you could add more wind turbines and it wouldn't take a lot of time you could adjust price you could have conservation programs so you could adjust to demand on an incremental basis and you could do it over time and of course you could spread your risk because you would have a variety of projects maybe some would not go too well, maybe some will go very well, but you've diversified both over time and space. We're at the base of Smoky Mountain and it's going to get a big makeover for this season and it's all thanks to IOC's Wobblers 3 project. He said I better have snow for him on the 15th of December and I said he better have lifts for us on the 15th of December. I'll have more on that coming up on Here and Now. Snow for the ski hill. Yes. yes. Lucky them. <laughs> <laughs> we had a wonderful long weekend oh, for most nice. of us. Yeah. yeah, it was beautiful. Nice calm and sunshine. It was lovely. And today was quite nice too. Right. Uh, it was a bit gray out there, but uh, temperatures weren't too bad and winds were pretty light. We do have some rain uh, coming for the island tonight. We have some flurries for across Labrador. And uh, then we're in for a bit of a calm spell on Thursday, just before the rest of Hurricane Michael will hit the province. So uh, it's going to be getting a bit messy as we head into the weekend. I'll have all those details coming up a bit later.
Thanks, Carolyn. Well, certainly not what you want to see while seated in a dark theater. Some four-legged rodents have become unexpected film stars for moviegoers at the Avalon Mall. Here now is Jeremy Eden has been looking into this story. Jeremy, how have mice become the main attraction? Well, at least one film goer is giving her last trip to the cinema a big thumbs down. It appears that rodents have been getting more attention this past weekend than the stars on the screen. But both Cineplex and the Avalon Mall says it's working on the issue. When you go to a movie starring Bradley Cooper and Lady Gaga, you'd be hard pressed to find anything to take your eyes off the screen. Unless, of course, you see a few rodents scurrying around the fourth Cineplex. Facebook user Nicole Ashley took the close encounter of the furred kind on Saturday night. Her cinematic experience wasn't the only one. Another video of what appears to be mice in the Avalon Mall was shared as well. What has long been talked about now has proof in pictures. It's not a new issue at the shopping center. Government inspections have been picking up what the rodents have been laying down for almost two years. Early in 2017, the company that owns the mall, Fromby Reet, started some parking lot upgrades. Around the same time, inspections started noticing signs of rodents, including seeing a buildup of droppings, an issue that kept popping up until the most recent inspection in August. The Avalon Mall says it's aware of the issue and that it has contracts with pest control companies. It adds that each tenant also has its own pest control practices in place. Now, as for the company that owns the cinema here behind me, it says there was an increase in rodent activity this summer, but it is working on it. Now, a spokesperson for Cineplex says it and the Avalon Mall are working on the issue to make sure that moviegoers focus on what's on the screen and not what might be at their feet. Reporting live from here now, I'm Jeremy Eaton in St. John's. The newly realigned intersection on Kenmount Road reopened today. The intersection at Kenmount Road and Polina Road now aligned with the entrance to the Avalon Mall. They are now. The previous intersection didn't align. And that made the left turns really tricky. It was the site of a number of accidents, including a fatal one a few years ago. Crews worked to demolish the St. John's Heritage Building in the West End today. The former Waterford Manor bed and breakfast came crumbling down this afternoon. Council voted to level the 112-year-old building last year after it was extensively damaged in a 2016 explosion and fire. It's been boarded up ever since. The manor was first owned by the Delgados, a Spanish couple who ran a fruit and can candy company. It was later sold to Edgar Bowery and was used to house sick and wounded soldiers during the First World War. Well, as you heard Carolyn mention, Florida and Alabama have declared states of emergency and issued evacuation orders ahead of Hurricane Michael. And U.S. Gulf Coast residents are preparing for the onslaught of what could be one of the worst storms there in decades. And if you don't follow uh, warnings from officials, this storm could kill you. I normally laugh these things off, but uh, this one I'm taking a little bit more serious. We opened at 6 by 6.15. We sold out of every generator we had. The governor is warning of a monstrous storm expected to hit the region tomorrow with potentially deadly consequences. He's urging residents to evacuate if necessary. Winds of 170 kilometers per hour are in the forecast with torrential rain and storm surges that could flood low-lying areas. Florida has called in the National Guard and other emergency workers. Several schools and universities have canceled classes. Now, we're going to stay south of the border. Nikki Haley is quitting her job as U.S. Ambassador to the United Nations. The decision appears to have caught many in the Trump administration by surprise, and speculation is swirling about just why she's leaving. I'm a believer in term limits. I think you have to be selfless enough to know when you step aside and allow someone else to do the job. So thank you, Mr. President. You, it's Nikki. been an thank honor you. of a lifetime. And I will say this um, for all of you that are going to ask about 2020. No, I'm not running for 2020. I can promise you what I'll be doing is campaigning for this one. Now, Haley is one of only six women among 24 officials in President Trump's cabinet. 
Her resignation is effective at the end of this year, and Trump is expected to announce her replacement in the coming weeks. Smoky Mountain in Labrador City is getting a big makeover for this ski season, and it's all thanks to a new mining pit that was recently completed, right in its backyard. The Iron Ore Company of Canada says the new lifts and lights will be up and running for this winter. Here now is Jacob Barker, visited the ski hill to bring us the details. For Smoky Mountain, the change has been a long time coming. Well, it's been old for 25 years. A new quad chairlift and two new surface lifts, big plans and a huge makeover. All these lifts are going to take us higher and, and they're going to offer a wider range of options for, for the skiers and the snowboarders. IOC is footing the bill for the new toys. Chairlift line from here to here. They agreed to do so as part of their Wabush 3 expansion, which was recently completed. The new pit is right in Smokey's backyard, so the new lifts had to be put in to withstand the nearby blasts. They made us whole and they gave us a ski hill that would, would live with that blasting. And along with the new lifts, the mountain is also supposed to be getting a lot brighter. This is going to be an incredible amount of lighting going on the hill. We, we took 30 odd poles down with lights on them and there's 120 going back up. This is a this is a great engineering system from considered to be state of the art. Leitner Poma installs the lifts around the world no matter the size of the ski resort, big or small. Smoky is it's a it's a very precious place. It's nobody would have thought that that this would be here and I'm, I'm so happy that Smokey gives the opportunity to people from Labrador City to come and ski and have a good time. The plan is for the work to be done by mid-December, and the club says it has assurances from IOC it will be done on time. I had a conversation with someone at IOC who, who no one wants to let down, and he said I better have snow for him on the 15th of December, and I said he better have lifts for us on the 15th of December. <laughs> <laughs> I can't wait to see it, to see people riding the hill because it's going to make it much more fun. A big lift for the town, just in time for the Christmas season. Jacob Barker, CBC News, Labrador City. Moose hunting is well underway around the province, but besides filling up their own freezers, could hunters take some of their bounty and share it with food banks? A local hunting group thinks yes. We'll find out more.
Welcome back, everyone. Sorry, Anthony. That's okay. I was going to say I was away last week. Cause you, did you notice? I was, yes. Okay, good. <laughs> said you noticed. Yeah. Okay, perfect. <laughs> well, part of that assignment, I started in Corner Brook and drove back across the island. And the leaves were, I know breathtaking sounds like a cliche, but it was such a canvas of color, mm -hmm. magnificent. And you were in Central? I was in Central, yeah. and actually you could see the leaves turning over the three days yeah. that I was out there. It was so lovely. It's a, such a great time of year, and the viewer photos that we're getting are just spectacular Excellent. as well. So yeah, lots of beautiful things to, to look at outside. And the weather has been quite nice, at mm -hmm. least uh, here in the east. Today was, was nice, nice and calm, and uh, we do have some rain moving through tonight, but I'm going to start with a look at the highs uh, today. It looks like uh, St. Lawrence, the hot spot, a balmy 10 degrees today, got up to 7 degrees in St. John's, uh, Labrador City just uh, 2 degrees there. Now we do have some rain moving across the island overnight tonight. You can see on the satellite and radar uh, on the west coast right now, and that's uh, heading for the Avalon Peninsula as well. So this is how it's going to play out overnight. Uh, you can see that it's sticking around mostly for uh, the east, so that's where the, the bulk of the rain is going to fall overnight tonight. Labrador looking at lots of little patchy flurries uh, through the evening hours, so about 5 to 10 millimeters of rain expected for the St. John's area tonight. Light winds as well, 5 millimeters for the Marystown Buren area, as well as for uh, Gander, 2 to 4 millimeters for the west, the Port of Ask, uh, Corner Brook area, so and also some light southwesterly winds on the west coast tonight as well. So as we get into Labrador, really at the freezing mark. It's uh, pretty chilly up there. We're looking at uh, some flurries throughout the evening hours. Minus two in Lab City, but overnight with that wind chill, it's going to feel more like minus eight and those northwesterly winds gusting to 20 overnight. So very light winds there. So tomorrow on the island, we're looking at a mainly cloudy day, but lots of uh, showers here and there throughout the day, scattered showers throughout the day. So it's going to be, you're going to want to take your raincoat just in case. It's, it's going to be gray. It's going to be drizzly. You'll see a shower or two. For Labrador, we have some clearing, but uh, also some flurries uh, throughout the day there. So getting up to about 10 degrees should be that temperature when you wake up in the morning. Uh, it might get a little bit cooler throughout the day. Some blustery winds, though, a northwesterly wind, 30 gusting to 50. So it's going to be a little bit windy out there tomorrow and with those chants of uh, showers throughout the day, as well as in Central, uh, looking at some showers throughout the day and getting up to about seven degrees uh, for most places there on the West Coast. Six degrees as the high, going to be fairly breezy there as well. Northwesterly winds 30, gusting to 50, heading up to the Straits, cooling down a little bit. Uh, instead of uh, shower chances, you're turning into the flurry uh, chances for southeastern Labrador throughout the day tomorrow, and you can see all of the flurries uh, on the map there. So yeah, little bits and pieces here and there. Minus two as the high in Labrador City tomorrow with the northwesterly wind uh, gusting to 40. So as I mentioned earlier, things are going to be pretty calm for the next couple of days weather wise. But uh, as we head into Friday, we are looking at the system moving in the remnants of Hurricane Michael. So I'll get into all of those details a little bit later. Debbie, back to you. Thanks, Carolyn. The demand at food banks continues to rise. According to Food Banks Canada, more than 26,000 people in this province used food banks in 2016. And that demand means it's not easy to keep shelves stocked with nutritious, protein-rich foods. But a local hunting conservation group would like to help. They're advocating for an initiative allowing food banks to distribute wild game. Barry Fordham is head of the Newfoundland Association of Hunters and Anglers. What is it that your group is proposing exactly? Our group is proposing to implement the Hunters Feeding the Hungry program here in Newfoundland and Labrador. It's a program where big game hunters can take a portion of their meat, uh, the big game meat most, uh, mostly, and donate it to the food banks under the Hunters Feeding the Hungry program. Mm. Is this happening anywhere else in the country? Yes, uh, I'm, I'm aware of that it is happening in Nova Scotia. A lot of the uh, states in, in America had this program as well. And how exactly would it work? Uh, the hunter would take a portion of the meat that uh, would feel like donating and take it, turn it into a government-approved uh, processor, we'll say an example of Halliday's, where they would process the game meat into burger meat, which is the easiest possible way to cook it, and that would then be distributed to the food banks if need be, then they could distribute it from there. 
There's no money exchanging hands here. This is a donation from a hunter. Absolutely not. No money whatsoever. Uh, it's it donated. The only monies that would be come about is if uh, we needed to corporate spent monies from corporate sponsors to help pay for the processing of the game meat and the tr packaging and the transportation of it. And you think hunters are on board with this? I think I've received a lot of positive feedback and not everybody's going to want to do it and it's not going to be like there's going to be a big load of surplus meat in the beginning. It's like anything new starting and be you know, footsteps at a time. However, I'm looking at, at reaching out to that I have not yet reached out to Newfoundland Labrador Outfit Association because we have uh, non-resident hunters come here and some which may not want to meet at all and that would be a huge donation to the food banks across the island. Why isn't this happening here? Is it because government regulations need to change? Yes, absolutely. The two biggest indicators that I've been told from various ministers since 2012 is that the li liability issue and the legality issue. The legality issue is the meat is not supposed to change hands three times. In other words, I can give it to you, but you can't give it to anybody else. There are certain parameters with that as well, like span of time. And the other is that could be solved with a stroke of the pen, I'm sure. And I'm not a legal smiggle, but that could be easily fixed. The liability issue, what happens if somebody gets sick? Um, in Nova Scotia, they have the Good Samaritans Act or law. Here in Newfoundland and Labrador, we have the Donated uh, Food Act in 1997 that protects anybody that who donates the, different, the, the meat to different people. Uh, it's, it's, there's nobody in Canada, according to a, uh, an article I just read, there's nobody in Canada that's been sued or held liable for anybody getting sick that the meat has been donated. So what is government saying? Uh, they're, they're not really saying very much. They're offering different solutions, which I feel is not uh, viable solutions. Uh, it, you know, my contention is if it can be done in Nova Scotia with the blessing of the Nova Scotia provincial government, the blessing of the Nova Scotia Federation of Anglers Hunters Group, who I've been talking to today, and the Hunters Feeding the Hungry program, why cannot not be implemented here in Newfoundland and Labrador. You must have already been in touch with food banks. What's the reception? I've been talking with Mr. Egg Walters since 2012. We've been trying, both trying, did several interviews over the years again, trying to get this uh, program up and running. Um, he he, uh, he expressed the liability issue, and again, I put the same question to him. Why can't it be, if it can be done in Nova Scotia, why not here? And as well, then the storage facilities as well. Uh, they want to mix the game meat up with the, with the domestic products, but that's easily fixed according to my calculations because I'd look for a corporate sponsor or go to a different or to a certain manufacturer to look for a donation of money in the fund or look for a donation of a, a deep freezer appliance to be distributed to, to food banks here on the island. Okay, we will keep watching this situation. Thanks very much, Barry Fordham. Thank you very much for the opportunity to get this out, and I think it's a great uh, program with high integrity, and it's been around for quite a long time. It's interesting, and Barry, you know, raises the point they can do it in Nova Scotia. So I guess it's a question of, of will, right? Yeah, a question of will, and I know government is looking into this. Um, Are we talking whole pieces of moose, or what uh, would that, what would what the idea be? Uh, Barry was talking about ground meat. They would only okay. uh, have that package to distribute. It's easier to cook, uh, less trouble for people who might be collecting it from yeah. food banks. Seems like a good idea. I'm not sure what the counter argument is right. at this point. Yeah. So. You have to let your your head rule your heart because you get you can get caught up in this. Hundreds showed up to drop big bucks on a St. John's auction. That's ahead.
Welcome back to Here and Now. Well, back to our top story now. Is vigilantism ever justified? A judge released Stephen and Mitchell Maloney from custody this afternoon. They face charges of break and enter, assault with a weapon, and forcible confinement. They'll be back in court next month. Mike Cal organized a rally on behalf of the two men, not, he says, because what they did was right, but because, like the accused, people in Whitless Bay are fed up with rampant theft. I met Cal outside the courtroom. As you know, some people sort of look at what happened and uh, they think that this is an issue of people taking the law into their own hands, right? Yeah, but, you know, we don't condone that. And, you know, I guess the Maloney's made a mistake. I mean, we got to go the route of the law and uh, take the evidence to the police and let them work with it. Uh, we don't condone, uh, you know, taking the law in your own hands, but uh, we understand how they got frustrated by losing their, uh, their equipment, and uh, we're just delighted that they can get home now with their family. Now they had a lot of stuff, a lot of gear stolen from their from their vessel, and obviously they were they were angry about this. Can you talk to me a little bit about the amount of theft that happens in your community? We've had a lot of theft over the last uh, two or three years. We've had cars stolen and burnt. We've had cars stolen outside of people's homes. We've had numerous quads, power tools, stuff like that stolen, and it's. It doesn't seem to be getting any less. It seems to be pretty frequently. How do drug habits fit into the stuff that's being stolen, in your estimation? Well, I guess, you know, the people that are, uh, are uh, stealing this stuff, I mean, they're stealing it for money. They're not the people that you meet in the grocery store buying their groceries. So they're spending the money. It's got to be drugs. Yesterday, last question for you, a lot of people got together on Thanksgiving Day of all days. What does that tell you about the level of frustration in your, where you live? Oh, people are very, very concerned, very concerned. And I mean, uh, you have to sleep in a community that you know in the nighttime you don't know if your car is going to be burnt or your quad is going to be stolen. People are very upset and that's why they showed up on yesterday at a very short notice on a very important day that they should be with their family. A weekend auction near Patty's Pond brought in about a million and a half dollars over the weekend. Hundreds showed up at the Islander RV lot near Patty's Pond Saturday. The business went into receivership in September and filed for bankruptcy last week. More than 300 people were there to bid on RVs, trailers and ATVs. Another 150 joined in online. This is our first time doing this auction type thing, so uh, so yeah, it was definitely something, you know, we didn't really know if we were going to get it, and actually, for this one, I actually thought someone else bid higher than us, and the next thing he said, we guys, we were the winners. And it is pretty intense, and you, you have to let your your head rule your heart, because you get can get caught up in this, and uh, you know, they're going, say, for 45,000 to, uh, to 48,000. You think, oh, there's not much of a difference, but you know, you add that 45 to the little bit you're going to pay more, and it, and it can end up. There'll be people who are going to let their heart rule today, I think. You can't take it back. And you can, no. <laughs> you definitely sure. can't take it back. No. So it's crazy because Joey Smallwood is really good with people and uh, I feel like that must have trickled down because I just love, love, love people. I could just listen to people tell me their story nonstop. I think that's why I became an actor. It's in the DNA. Coming up, Samora Smallwood on her famous family, filming at home and pushing for more diversity on television.
he's not your run-of-the-mill guy, Kevin McDonald, the 86-year-old who found salvation in a sawmill. Sunday at noon and Monday at 7. Welcome back to Here and Now. She's an actress with deep Newfoundland roots and politics in her DNA. Samora Smallwood is back home shooting Rex after scoring a lead role in the detective series. But the great niece of Joey Smallwood says it was her experience as a biracial actress that pushed her to take a behind the scenes role, pushing for more diversity in the Canadian film and television industry. Here she is speaking with the St. John's Morning Show's Chrissy Holmes. How does auditioning work and how many women are seen uh, for roles? And the stats can be kind of alarming on screen. It's still four to one. For every four male characters, it's one female character. Um, and you're seeing all of that. So the fire got lit in my belly for that. I was just like, oh my gosh. And I'm obsessed I'm with people and data. And I just knew this is where I needed to be. And then working alongside all these really inspiring people who are dedicated to the cause of artists, supporting artists and being able to make a living wage and actually make a career off of it. How did your experience as an actress working in the industry actually motivate you to want to get to a place where you had the power to make change? For me as an actress, it's kind of tricky because we're seeing more change with diversity on screen, but I'm biracial and people always can't tell, they can't always tell what I am. And I remember reading Meghan Markle was talking about this and she was saying I was never white enough for white roles and I was never black enough for black roles. So that started to frustrate me because I'm the type of actor who will audition for her parts. I have, I like to know what's shooting, what's happening. Like I'm, I don't live in Newfoundland anymore, but I'm always like, well, what's shooting there? And then I like to see that if I didn't get a part or if a show's coming that I didn't even audition for, how many people of color do they have? How much LGBTQ plus representation on the show is there? All different representations. How many women are writing, directing on the shows? I'm that kind of a person. Um, and then just seeing all that and tracking the progress, I started to notice that in my own personal experience, that is very true. Sometimes if a production is looking for a person of color, they want to be able to check that box with the big black marker. And I thought it would be nice if we could open up the conversation to seeing all different actors for different roles and not having it fall so strictly on those racial lines and just opening up people's eyes to seeing performers for all different parts and letting the talent fall where it may. That's one piece. And then also a part of what we're pushing broadcasters to do is, um, so CBC actually has pledged by 2020 to have parody on their shows, which is amazing, right? That's going to be so great. And you have shows like uh, Working Moms that have so much representation for women on the show. But what we really want broadcasters to commit to is a fair representation for diversity on screen. Because I know that if you are a child and you're watching TV, we all loved it. I grew up and I was obsessed with film and TV. You want to see people that look like you. Not just for egoic reasons, but to give that child that idea that that flame could be lit, that you could go anywhere. So one of the things that I'm proudest of um, what's happening is an industry-wide coalition, ACTRA with productions, even with government, having those conversations and seeing the education and preventative education. How does your family feel knowing that you're at this sort of cultural shift as well. You've got your hand on the wheel with some of these huge changes. Like, you know, you're like Joey Smallwood. Yeah. Oh, right? my gosh. So it's crazy because Joey Smallwood is really good with people. And uh, I feel like that must have trickled down because I just love, love, love people. I could just listen to people tell me their story nonstop. I think that's why I became an actor. But my family is pretty proud. Like, my mom was a single mom. Like, after her and my father divorced, it was just her, and she's always excited, and I always fill her in, and she just reminded me the other day, actually, it was so cute, she brought up when I moved to Toronto, and she's like, do you remember when we would walk down the street, we would walk past the actress sign, and we would just get a picture, because then I wasn't even in the union, I was still a non-union actress, we'd just get a picture, she goes, now you're in the room, girl, you're in the room, because life is such a frenetic pace, right, and you know that, it's fast-paced, and there's so much going on, and it's nice to have my mom kind of remind me to slow down and see how far I've come from when I moved to Toronto, hoping to join the union, be an actor member and act on screen. And now to be on council, she just told me that the other day. She's like, take this moment, just remember. And I do. It's, it's so awesome. It's really, really great. Well, lots of energy, <laughs> to she say is. the least. She has uh, Joey Smallwood's genes and uh, yes. a communicator for sure. Um, she did tell Chrissy 
that I think it was she was 13 when she left, but she comes back frequently right. to the province, and that's why she kept her eye on what might be available to yeah. work on down here. So, mm -hmm. good luck, another yeah. Newfoundland connection. And I think Joey would be very proud of her loquaciousness <laughs> as well. <laughs> to Manitoba now, a Winnipeg mom wanted to give her daughter opportunities that she never had as a child. It started with a fundraiser, and now it's turned into a full-time business. The CBC's Jillian Taylor explains. That's nice. I got two X now. Folding and organizing has become a family affair for Chrissy Slater and her kids. Each piece of clothing created in this family's business bears a design Slater created. Growing up in poverty, um, like me, like when I was younger, my world was so tiny. It was so tiny, it was so small. Like I could have never thought that I could be a business owner. Red Road Clothing was born out of a fundraiser to open up her daughter's world, to send 17-year-old Ariel to Italy for her grad trip. In January, the mother of six created this design called Berry Fast. It represents Ariel's coming-of-age ceremony of giving up berries for an entire year. It's supposed to teach you, um, like, empathy and, like, how to give up something for another person, especially when, like, you become a mother. Slater says the fundraiser lasted a month. They sold out of their entire stock of t-shirts and hoodies. The community wanted to support her and because her story went so far, reached so many people on social media that we were, we were busy for 17 days straight driving. Hand delivering each item, building a customer base that wanted more. Slater never planned on creating other designs, but she couldn't say no to the community and is now up to four. I'm so proud of my mom. She's like the best role model ever. Like I don't think I have any other role models besides her because she just outshines everyone else. Slater has now quit her job and is in the process of incorporating the business and creating a website to accommodate sales requests from across the country. As a mother, everything we do for our children, we just want them to have a good life, a better life. And things keep getting better. Slater is creating a fifth design, which she hopes to have ready in time for Christmas. Jillian Taylor, CBC News, Winnipeg. Pretty dark out there right now. This is a live shot of St. John's Harbor from the room's camera. Yeah, we have some rain on the way for the St. John's area tonight. So it's gonna be a bit of a wet evening to come. I'll have all those details coming up.
Welcome back. Now, before we get to the weather, a uh, bit of indulgence over the weekend, of course, being Thanksgiving, but we were not the only ones who were perhaps having a, a larger meal than we necessarily should have. <laughs> this video was taken on Sunday in Kent's Pond, just off Prince Philip Drive. Oh, wow. While many were uh, feasting wow. <laughs> on turkey, this osprey was out catching supper of its own. Wow, yep. that's huge yep. fish. <laughs> Debbie, you're an angler. That, that looks like a really good trout. It's bigger than the salmon the, I've, I've uh, managed to <laughs> hit. <laughs> looks like the osprey is also being dragged into the water. Oh my goodness, an osprey is wow, that's definitely reasonably a trout, right? big. Oh, it's a trout yeah, for sure. I but. think. Yeah, well, no, it it's is. over Kent's Pond, yeah. isn't it? Well, salmon season's over, so it has yeah. to be a trout. <laughs> I wonder if the osprey needed a nap afterwards, too. I mean, no, I want to know where that <laughs> osprey fish is, so I can go cast a line myself there. <laughs> oh, amazing. Yeah. Well, time now to have a look at the weather. It's going to be pretty calm over the next few days, but we, we do have some weather in the long range to talk about. But I'm going to start with uh, the current temperatures in the province right now. We're sitting at 6 degrees in St. John's, 8 degrees in St. Lawrence, Labrador City at uh, one degree right now. So tonight we do have lots of rain on the island, particularly for the Avalon Peninsula. And you can see all of the little flurries here in Labrador as well. So yeah, that's gonna, it's gonna be pretty wet overnight for the east in particular, the Buren Peninsula and uh, for central areas, about five to 10 millimeters of rain expected overnight. And then tomorrow it's gonna be a mainly cloudy day with a chance of showers throughout the day and a chance of flurries for for most of Labrador. So this is the picture tomorrow getting up to about nine degrees in St. John's with a chance of showers. It's going to be a little bit windy northwesterly winds gusting to 50. Uh, so for central areas looking at about seven degrees as the high for tomorrow and six in the west and also quite windy there as well. Five degrees for St. Anthony. So pretty much a chance of showers across the board for the island tomorrow. For Labrador, a chance of flurries for most places. Nain could see a flurry or two, two degrees as the high there, minus two in Lab City. So the west will definitely be the cold spot uh, tomorrow. A mix of sun and cloud for Happy Valley, Happy Valley Goose Bay and the Straits as well. So a nice day shaping up there, but on the cool side. So Thursday, things are looking really calm, really not much on the go at all. <laughs> Barely any cloud cover, uh, no precipitation to worry about. So it's a mix of sun and cloud across the board for the island and for Labrador. Temperatures, you can see how temperatures are really starting to cool down. We're no longer in the double digits anymore. So getting up to about six or seven degrees uh, on Thursday for the island. One for uh, western Labrador, four degrees for eastern Labrador. So this is uh, kind of the next thing that we're going to be keeping an eye on, the remnants of Hurricane Michael, this is Thursday evening. You can see that it's pushing its way to the province. We have some snow for Labrador and we have some rain uh, for the island. So it's a bit too early to know amounts yet, but uh, it's definitely going to be something that's going to affect us as we head into the weekend. So showers for the west, chance of showers for central areas and for uh, the east. Periods of snow or rain for western Labrador and flurries uh, or showers for eastern Labrador. So it is going to be a little bit messy as we head into the weekend. Showers persisting on Saturday, a little bump in the temperature though heading up to 14 degrees in the east on Saturday and then clearing for Sunday a very similar story for uh, central areas 12 degrees as the high there so the rain will persist uh, throughout the weekend and uh, as well for central areas getting up to 11 degrees and continuing with the showers there on Sunday for Labrador showers starting to clear but still a, a cloudy day on Sunday five degrees as the high on the weekend right now and a chance of flurries for western Labrador and Temperatures sitting right around the freezing mark. And that's your forecast. Debbie, back to you. Thanks again, Carolyn. Well, it's a common apple on supermarket shelves. The tart red and round Macintosh created centuries ago in a Canadian garden. It's produced more than any other apple here and in the northeastern United States. Now the birthplace of the Macintosh apple is up for sale. But as Stu Mills reports, selling this piece of history isn't exactly a piece of cake. It's a piece of Canadian history, but that's not what Gerd Skoff was looking for when he became the owner more than 30 years ago. Skoff says he wasn't much interested in the history of the Macintosh apple or in the lives of the famous Macintoshes who once lived here. 
In fact, he purchased the place almost by accident. In 1987, a real estate agent showed him another property down the road. Scoff didn't like its low ceilings. And uh, suddenly the gentleman was saying to me, you know, I have another property for you if you want to see the Macintosh. Ever since John Macintosh began nurturing one apple tree and its sharply sweet fruit in 1811, the place has had an aura of celebrity. For Scoff, the history buffs who make the pilgrimage to Macintosh Mecca have been mostly a nuisance. He put up warning signs and bigger fences. And they were coming in the back picking apples, and I had no control. No one lives here now, and much of the old orchard is returning to forest. Time marches on. Hundreds of pounds of Max lay rotting on the ground. That's okay with Scoff. It's okay if it's selling in eight or nine years. It's okay also, you know, I'm in no rush. He's asking $875,000, but the property is a definite fixer-upper. Though the seeds of 200 years of Canadian history were planted here, the government isn't interested in the Macintosh farm. Heritage Canada says Mac apples aren't a national symbol they're obliged to protect, and Parks Canada says the site of the 207-year-old Macintosh farm isn't a national historic site and isn't about to be made one. In any case, Scoff isn't interested in having the place turned into a park. I'm not getting involved with the government. Why not? No, I, I just don't like it. I don't trust them. This fifth-generation farmer runs a booming commercial orchard just down the road. It'd be a hell of a pile of money and a lot of work to, to get it presentable. It's been run down for too long. Dean Bexted says whatever historical value the Macintosh farm once had, it's been lost due to neglect. Stu Mills, CBC News, Dundee. Well, look at this beautiful viewer photo of the day. Gorgeous fall day with the sunshine, the leaves are changing, just lovely. I'll tell you that this photo was taken in a very well-known park in the province. I think I see an apple there. You better shut it down. <laughs> <laughs> I'll let you know where this shot was taken after the break. Gorgeous picture you just showed us yeah. before the break. Mm -hmm. Have a look at this. Any uh, guesses where this was taken? Could you give me a hint? St. John's. That... Oh, okay. Uh, Popular park. Uh, <laughs> uh, I kind of know. <laughs> Pippi Park. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> it is beautiful. Yeah, oh my job. goodness. 
And you, lovely. you would never know you're so close to the capital city. That's why a lot of people love to spend some time during the summer there. Yep, camp out there and go for walks. Martin O'Driscoll, thank you very much for sending uh, this shot in. And if anyone else has a picture that uh, you'd like to send in, please do email it to nlphotos at cbc.ca. Yeah. Hard to believe we'll be cross-country skiing and snowshoeing there in the next uh, couple of months with any luck. So true. Yeah, just I'd look rather, happy. Not yet. <laughs> I'd rather have that than sleet and yeah. you know, yeah. all that. Could so always hope. Bring on the white stuff. I might be in the minority, but <laughs> two months from now. <laughs> See you tomorrow. See ya. Bye.